Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you are new here. I hope you're all doing so, so well. Welcome back to another true crime and makeup video. Today, I like I have listened to your request. You want an unsolved case? So I've got an unsolved case for you. Today we are going to be talking about the case of Bible John. So Bible John is an unidentified serial killer who was said to terrorise women between 1968 and 1969 in Glasgow. All three of his victims attended the Barrowland Ballroom. All three of them were beaten brutally, especially to their face and head. They were then raped. All three women were strangled to death with their own stockings. And all three of them were on their period at the time that their murder was committed. Bible John would also leave their tampon or their pad on or near their body as well. The handbags would be stolen, but the contents of the women's handbags would be discarded near their bodies. Bible John's victims were all brunette between the ages of 25 to 32, and they had all met Bible John at the Barland Ballroom. Now, the Barland Ballroom is like a dance hall, a concert venue. It was very popular back in the day, and it's even still popular now. Like many bands who tour will come to the Barrowlands in Glasgow. Now, Bible John has never been identified. This is still an unsolved case, but it does remain open to this day. And this was one of the most extensive manhunts in all of Scottish criminal history. And they used methods in this case that they had never ever used before that they would continue to use moving forward. This case was also the first time that the Crown Office would allow a composite sketch to be released on TV and in newspapers in attempts to identify this killer. At the end, I will be discussing all the theories that are there online and that have been speculated over the years. And I will also provide my own theory, which I think is quite a good one. If you do enjoy this video, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and put the notification bell on so you don't miss when I upload, which is between two to three times per week with a new interesting case each time. My social media handles will be linked down below for you guys as well if you wish to give them a follow, but ultimately just make sure you subscribe. All the details of what I've used on my face today will also be linked down below for you guys too. You will also find my email there if you want to send any case suggestions over via email or you can leave them in the comments down below. But I'm not going to ramble any longer. This case is just crazy. We need to get into it. So here we go. Here is the case of Bible John. Life is honestly testing me so hard these days because I filmed this video last night. Saturday night I spent two and a half hours filming this video only to find that I had somehow recorded without sound. So we're back again. Let's just get into it before I rant. So the Barrowlands Ballroom, or as it's now referred to as just the Barrowlands or the Barras, was built in 1934 and it was actually named after the Barrowland Market in Glasgow. Does that look crazy? Now the building was completely rebuilt from the ground up after it was destroyed in a fire in 1958 and then it reopened on the 24th of December 1960. So quite a quick turnaround for like a building being burnt down then built back up. Love that. Now the Barras, as we call it these days, is a very popular venue in Glasgow. A lot of bands will play there. My dad has been to the Barras like countless amounts of times to see punk bands and it's a very, very popular place. But back in the day, it was the Barrowland Ballroom. And within the Barrowlands back then, they would have like dances on like a Thursday and a Saturday night that was for over 25s. Usually it was married people that would attend these venues. These over 25 nights were actually referred to as grab a granny night because they were over 25, they were considered grannies. Um, I'm now 26, so... I would be part of Grab a Granny. Love that for me. So a bit of a tangent there, I do apologise, but this was a very, very popular spot like back in the 1960s. This is where everyone would go. And this is also where Bible John would find his victims. So on the 23rd of February 1968, the naked body of 25-year-old nurse Patricia Docker was found in the doorway of a lockup garage by a man who was on his way to work in Carmichael in Glasgow. 
And I always think what's absolutely devastating in this case is her body was found only yards from her home in Langside Place. And I always hate hearing things like this because it's like, has she been tormented on her way home and then murdered? Or has she almost got home and someone just came out and attacked her? It's just horrible to think of almost being home and then just being killed. Now they said it was very evident that Patricia had suffered from extensive blunt force trauma especially to her face and her head in general that had been brutally attacked. The police also said that it looks as though she had been strangled to death with a really strong ligature which they believed at this point might have been a belt. Patricia's handbag, her watch and her clothes were missing from the scene. Her clothes would never actually be recovered but her handbag was recovered from the river car when the police had sent down like an underwater investigation unit and then her watch was found in like a pool of water that was close by the murder scene. Now when police started to conduct like door-to-door -door inquiries. A witness had said that the night before Patricia was found, they had heard female screams, like blood-curdling screams, that were screaming, leave me alone. But they never reported this. I think they were assuming that it's maybe someone who's drunk, who's just like acting up. But regardless, like if you ever hear screams like that, please, please, please go to your window, look out, see if you can see anything, go to your front door, have a look. And if you are worried, please phone the police because it could save somebody's life. Not blaming this person here because I totally get that. You don't think that someone's going to be murdered right outside, but I think these days we just have to be so vigilant. Now, the ambulance man on the scene who came to retrieve Patricia's body, he actually recognised her. Of course, she was a nurse and he was able to say that she worked at the Mearns Kirk Hospital and unfortunately, Patricia's dad would have to come in the very next day to identify his daughter and confirm that it was her. And honestly, I cannot imagine having to do this, having to identify a loved one that you know has been brutally murdered. And especially the fact that she was beaten so badly to her face and her head. He's had to look at that and imagine what's happened to his daughter. And it just makes me feel sick. Now the post-mortem that was conducted basically concluded that Patricia's cause of death was strangulation by a strong ligature. It was also said that Patricia's body showed no real signs of sexual assault. The stage of rigor mortis in her body, they believed that she had died just very shortly after leaving the Barrelam Ballroom. So between the Barrelam Ballroom and her trying to get home, there was a very short time frame in which she was murdered. So at this point, police believe that the killer has grabbed Patricia and repeatedly punched and kicked her in the face, which made her scream, leave me alone, twice by the way. This was screamed twice by this female, leave me alone. Police believe that they had then went on to strangle her to death and then they ran away and left her body with nothing but a shoe nearby. They had stripped her of all her belongings, all her clothes and just left her there for everyone to see. Then on Saturday the 16th of August 1969, a 31-year-old mother of three, Jemima MacDonald, had attended the Barrowland Ballroom. She was quite a regular at the Barrowlands, like people who went often knew of Jemima. She loved to go there and have a good time, have a drink, have a dance, have a laugh. So she was quite well known at the Barrowland Ballroom. And close to midnight, she had been seen in the company of a young man who was said to be well-dressed and well-spoken. He had short brown hair with light streaks and was said to be between either six foot to six foot two. Now, it was said that it was likely that he spoke with a Glaswegian accent. They thought it was likely that he could be from the area. And it was said that he would always insert biblical quotations whenever he was speaking to someone. He found a way to work in the Bible. Then Jemima was seen leaving the Barrowland Ballroom just after midnight. So now it's like the early hours of the 17th of August. And she was seen leaving with this man. Now, she was last seen walking either towards the Main Street or Landrissy Street, which was actually in the direction of her home. Now, it gets to about 12.48am, so 20 to 1 in the morning, where Margaret O'Brien, Jemima's sister, 
She's currently watching Jemima's children and she is becoming very concerned when Jemima hasn't returned home. But she's thinking, you know, maybe she stayed at a friend's, maybe she's wanting just to continue the party, have a night off being a mum, just enjoy herself. So she gives her the benefit of the doubt. Now, later that day, Margaret O'Brien was growing even more concerned. She still hadn't heard from Jemima. And there was talks from young children within the village had been at like this abandoned derelict house in McKeith Street and apparently they had been talking about a body being inside the derelict house. This, like, do you know that way when you get a gut feeling, it's like that feeling in your stomach and in your chest where you're like, something is not right. But again, Margaret wanted to believe that her sister was okay and she was probably just with a friend. Now, come the Monday, Jemima's sister Margaret has still not heard from her and she is just like distraught and beside herself at this point. So she decides herself that she is going to go to this derelict building in McKeith Street and just check to see if it was all just rumours about a body lying in there. When Margaret walks into this derelict building, I don't think anything would prepare her for what she would find. She found the battered body of her sister lying face down with her shoes and her stockings lying next to her. Now a post-mortem would conclude that Jemima had been brutally raped and brutally beaten especially around her face and her head and then she had been strangled to death with one of her own stockings. Now they were also able to conclude that Jemima's murder had taken place around 30 hours before her body was discovered so shortly after leaving the Barrowland Ballroom. Now unlike Patricia Docker's body Jemima was fully clothed but her underwear had been torn and assuming for the rape to occur. However, just like Patricia, Jemima had been on her period at the time of her murder. Now, police inquiries into the murder of Jemima did provide several eyewitnesses that were able to accurately describe the man that Jemima had been seen with at the Barrowland Ballroom. They also done door-to-door -door inquiries in McKeith Street as well and people did confirm that yet again they had heard female screams. Now, despite hearing these female screams, no one was able to conclude an exact time that they had heard these, but they did say that they definitely heard it on the night that Jemima was said to be murdered. Now, what's crazy is despite all the countless similarities in this case, the women were beaten, then strangled. They both attended the Barland Ballroom and they had both been on their period at the time of their murder. Police did not have a single thought of, hmm, this might be linked. Not once. They, they didn't even think about putting two and two together. They thought it was not possible that this was the work of the same killer and they assumed that this was completely unrelated cases. And the case of Patricia Docker went cold very, very quick and police would say this was due to lack of eyewitnesses and the lack of any hard evidence. But people also said that the police investigation was hindered because the police didn't even realise that Patricia had been to the Barrowland Ballroom until three days after her murder had occurred. And it wasn't until 18 months after the body of Jemima MacDonald had been found that police started to think, mm, I mean, they might be related, but no. They, they just still could not conclusively link them together. And like, I get maybe not conclusively, but at least look into it as a possibility. Now, despite what they had thought earlier into the investigation when Patricia had not long been murdered, at this point, they're starting to doubt whether or not this man was a local to the area or simply just someone who would travel to this area to commit the crimes, if it was the same person. And this would actually be the first time in a Scottish manhunt where police would give a composite sketch to the press to distribute via televisions and newspapers in order to help identify a suspect. Now, both male and female undercover police would attend the Barrowland Ballroom in an effort to try and identify a suspect or just see if anyone looks suspicious. However, by October 1969, they were like, this isn't working, let's just stop it. So they, they halted that, they just stopped it. Now I was thinking, if I was a murderer, which I'm not, you know, but if I was, would I not notice people who look shady and are looking and examining everyone in the ballroom? Like, 
the thing is undercover police are great and some are really really amazing at what they do but there is cases where they make it too obvious that they're undercover and that they're looking for someone in particular like these people would be watching everyone's every move so as a murderer you're probably going to pick up on that and i genuinely believe that bible john knew for a fact that the undercover police were there because the minute that these undercover police stopped going to the barrelam ballroom on the 31st of October 1969, another body would turn up. So a man was walking his dog when he then discovered the body of 29-year-old Helen Pittock behind a tenement in the Scotson district of Glasgow. And her body was found next to a drain pipe in the back garden of her Errol Street flat. Again, this woman had nearly made it home and was murdered right on her property. It's like he's just waiting to strike these women or having hope of getting home and then he's taken it away. Helen was partially naked. She had been brutally beaten, especially to her face and head. She had then been raped and strangled to death. And just like the other case, she had been strangled with one of her own stockings. Now, Helen's handbag again was missing, but the contents of her handbag were scattered nearby her body. Helen also had grass stains on the soles of her feet, which the police believed was a struggle that had taken place. Like when Helen's being strangled, she's possibly been kicking along the ground to try and get some breath by relieving his grip. But unfortunately, she wouldn't get away or potentially she was trying to run away and then he grabbed her again. But it's just, it's so awful you know people being murdered anyway is just terrible but it's that struggle to fight for their life and then die in any way like it's just like i think that's just like so sad it's just oh it was also said that helen had a very very deep bite mark on her upper right thigh and just as the same with jemima and patricia she was also on her period at the time of her death, but Bible John had taken her sanitary pad and placed it under her left arm. Why? Why? Now, the night before Helen's murder, Helen had attended the Barrowland Ballroom, shock horror, with her sister Jean. And both Helen and Jean, they were speaking to two men. And weirdly enough, both of them were called John. One of them said that he worked as a slater and lived in Castle Milk. The other one was well-spoken, a bit more reserved, and he actually never stated where he lived. Now, the four of them were together for about an hour before they all decided to leave. They all left at the same time and Jean's dance partner, he had walked toward George Square to board a bus. So he headed home on the bus whilst Jean, Helen and the other John, they decided to get in a taxi together. So they set off from Glasgow Cross and they make the 20 minute journey toward Jean's home. I assume that Jean lived closer so it was easier to go her way and then pass by Helen's after. Now, it was during this taxi journey where the most important evidence relating to Bible John's psychological profile would become apparent. So once they arrive at Jean's home, Jean gets out of the taxi and then Helen and the other John head toward Helen's home in Scotston. So Jean had later told the police that Helen's dance partner was someone who didn't drink. He was quite against alcohol and he would also like insert quotations from the Old Testament. Now, if you watch my videos, right, do you know who it was that used to love to read from the Old Testament to our children? I'll give you a second. If you guess Ed Gein's mother, you would be right. He would also refer to the Barrowland Ballroom as an adulterous den iniquity. So like I was saying, the nights that he would murder with the over 25s night, which I said was likely to be a bunch of married people who may very well be estranged from their husbands or just looking to blow off some steam. In Bible John's mind, did he think that these women were going there solely to cheat and that's why he would target them? 
Bible John would also state that he strongly disapproved of any women going to the Barrowland premises when they were married. Oh no, if Bible John says we can't, we shouldn't. <laughs> Idiot. Now, Helen exited a taxi at Kelso Street and she watched as a taxi turned toward Errol Street. Now, Jean had described Bible John as a slim, tall, well-dressed individual who was wearing a well-cut brown Reed and Taylor suit. She also stated that he smoked embassy cigarettes and I kind of wish that I googled what they are. Like, are they kind of like a prestige cigarette, if you get them? She also recalled that Bible John had said that he was familiar with a lot of drinking premises within the Yoker district. So police were like, hmm, could this be a local who knows the area really well? Or is he someone who maybe moved into that area? Like, you know, how does he know this? Apparently, Bible John had also mentioned that he worked in a laboratory, but he never mentioned what he had done or where this was. So they didn't really have anything to go on with this. Jean was also able to provide like really distinct features that Bible John had. And one of that was his overlapping teeth. That was a very prominent, distinct feature that Bible John had. So Helen's given this description to the police. Bearing in mind, she spent a lot of time in the taxi and in the Barland ballroom with Bible John, but the bouncers go ahead and disagree with Helen's description. They say that this man was short, he was well spoken, but he had black hair, not the brown hair with the light streaks. Now, the last possible sighting of the suspect was made by a driver and conductor of a night bus. Now, they had actually seen a young man matching Jean's description to a T. They said that this man looked very dishevelled. He had like mud stains all over him as if he had been like in a fight or participating in a murder. And they also said that he had a red mark um, on his cheek below one of his eyes, which they thought looked like a big cut. He was seen exiting a bus at the junction of Dumbarton Road and Grey Street. And this was around 2am on the 31st of October. Now, they also said that he was fidgeting quite a bit. And from what it looked like, he was tucking like a short cuff of one of his sleeves into the sleeve of his jacket. Now, what's important to note here is that when Helen's body was found, a man's cuff link was found beside her body. This has got to be our guy. The man was also seen walking towards a public ferry to cross the River Clyde to get to the south side of the city. So finally, like a light bulb goes off in one of the police officers' heads and they're like, wow, wait, these must be linked. And now police were starting to believe that the murders might have occurred because the woman might have refused to have sex with Bible John due to them being on their period. But like, what's the chances that he picks up three women on their period? You know? Now, within hours of discovering Helen's body, the police drew up another composite sketch using the details given by her sister, Jean. Now, Jean believed that the sketch that was drawn up after the murder of Jemima MacDonald actually represented great likeness to the person who she was detailing. So their drawings were going to look very similar. Now, the suspect at this time with the hair that was described, it was unfashionably short for that era of time. So not only are we looking for a sadistic, horrible, sicko, murderer, awful person, but we're also looking for someone who doesn't have a great sense of fashion. Now, because the hair was quite unusual for that era, they had asked 450 hairdressers in and around Glasgow if they had given this man this haircut. And the hairdressers were like, no, absolutely not. And like, let's be honest, a guy like Bible John, he's probably cutting his own hair or his mother is still cutting his own hair. Now, dentists in and around the city of Glasgow as well were also given the sketch and also the details regarding his teeth. They were asked to examine their medical records and see if they had anyone on file whose teeth matched the description of Bible John. So they were looking for someone who had overlapping incisors and also a tooth missing on the upper right jaw. But again, no leads. This led nowhere. So we've got a guy with a really bad haircut and probably really bad breath because it sounds like he does not go to the dentist. Then in June of 1970, police employed a photo fit system, which they hoped by using this would give them even better likeness for the suspect. 
and this was again was the first time in Scottish criminal history where they used this method to try and identify a suspect. It's crazy. It like it's Bible John's case really just up the ante for the Scottish police. More than 100 detectives would be assigned to this case on a full-time basis. There was over 50,000 witness statements that they had taken and within the first year alone there was at least 5,000 suspects questioned. Now Helen's sister Jean, she would have to attend over 300 identity parades to try and work out if the suspect was in any of them. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to identify Bible John from the suspects that they had brought in. Now, at this point, the, the police did begin to frequent the Barrowland Ballroom again on the Thursday and Saturday over 25 nights, just to see if by any chance they could find a suspect. Now, despite such an extravagant manhunt, nothing would turn up and three of these cases for these women would turn cold. Because the cases had turned cold, the police believed that maybe the man wasn't local to the area anymore, maybe he had moved away, been institutionalised, been arrested or maybe joined armed forces. So they began circulating the composite sketch everywhere, TV, newspapers, all over the country and still nothing turned up. Now, several criminologists and investigators had believed that the work of Bible John could have actually been by serial killer Peter Tobin. If you know about him, then you know how sadistic this man was. If you don't, I might actually cover him in a later case if you want another Scottish case, but I feel like I'm doing too many right now. Let me know in the comments. But they believed it could have been the work of him. Now, Peter Tobin was convicted in 2007 of a 2006 murder of a Polish student by the name of Angelika Kluck. She had been raped, brutally beaten and stabbed to death. Now, one of the biggest discrepancies that investigators found when looking at Peter Tobin as a possible suspect was the fact that Bible John would leave his victims in public to be found, whereas Peter Tobin buried all of his known victims. Now, I should tell you that this is the theory time, okay? So Peter Tobin was one of the theories and I will tell you the rest, but just a few other details on the Peter Tobin theory. Police had initiated this operation. It was called Operation Anagram and it was originally initiated in 2006. Now, what police planned to do in Operation Anagram was basically go over all of Peter Tobin's known whereabouts and track his steps throughout the decades to see if the timeline of the Bible John murders would match up with where Peter Tobin was at that point in time. Now, a woman did tell investigators that she had been raped by Peter Tobin after meeting him in the Barrowland Ballroom in 1968. This was shortly after the first murders were committed by Bible John. However, Tobin was eliminated as a suspect from the Bible John case because when they were tracking his steps throughout the decades, they noticed that when the final two murders of Bible John had occurred, that Peter Tobin was currently in Brighton at that point, so it couldn't be him. One of the former investigators by the name of Les Brown, he believed that Bible John could have been a man that he had arrested back in 1969, very briefly. Now, he did have a great likeness to the composite sketch of Bible John, but the one thing that shut down his suspicions was the fact that he never had overlapping teeth, this man that he was suspecting. Now, in 2005, Les Brown would write an autobiography and detail his suspicions of John White. However, the man, John White, would then come forward and offer his DNA sample. So his DNA sample was compared against the semen sample taken from the scene of Helen Pittock murder and he was completely ruled out. It wasn't a match so this man was cleared. Now in 1983 a man by the name of Harry Wiley had contacted the Strathclyde police and he said that he believed his friend was Bible John. He said that his friend had extreme likeness to Bible John. They had both attended the Barrowland ballrooms back in the day when these murders were happening. He never really gave many reasons as to why he thought 100% that his friend was Bible John, apart from that he had read a news article and he just believed his friend matched the, the description. So police tracked down this man and it turns out that he has moved to the Netherlands, he's married to a Dutch woman and that was as far as their queries went. They never investigated 
any further. Now, years after the Bible John killings, loads of women, well, several women had came forward and said that they had been assaulted by Bible John after a night at the Barland Ballroom. One of these women were Hannah Martin, who said she had been raped by Bible John after a night at the Barrowlands with him in 1969. Hannah Martin even went as far to claim that she had given birth to Bible John's child in the January of 1970. What? But like, if, the, if she thinks that this was Bible John, why hasn't she offered up DNA sampling to you know, see if there is a match. In 1996, Strathclyde Police had exhumed the body of a John McInnes from Stonehouse Graveyard in Lanarkshire. Now, McInnes had served in the Scots Guards and he had died by suicide in 1988 at the age of 41. Now, he was a cousin of one of the original suspects in the Bible John case and he was also related to a senior police officer. So, a DNA sample was taken from McInnes to compare with the semen sample found on Helen Pittock's stockings, or the stockings that had been used to strangle Helen. Now, the DNA test did come back inconclusive at this point. And then due to insufficient evidence and in the inconclusive DNA test, he was ruled out as a suspect as well and his name was cleared. Now, I'm going to tell you my theory, right? And this is purely just my theory, my opinions. None of this is actual fact. Just what I believe could be possible. Possible, okay? I think it might have been a police cover-up, right? I think it might have been a police cover-up. I think a policeman might have been Bible John, and here's why. The undercover detectives were in the Barrowland Ballroom, you know, during the murders, trying to see if they could scope out a suspect. So during this time, if Bible John was within the police force, he knows that this is going on. So he's not going to frequent the Barrowland Ballroom at the risk of being caught, right? However, once the police sort of undercover investigation ceases, suddenly Bible John strikes again. Now, he, if he was in the police, he would know that the police investigation had ceased and that he could go back to committing these killings. I, I think that's pretty concrete, guys. I think, I think that could be a possibility. A police covered up, a policeman was Bible John. Like, I'm just saying, Right, I, I feel like that's quite a good one. Now, no further victims in Scotland or around the United Kingdom have been linked to Bible John after the three murders of these young women. And this manhunt for a murderer was one of the most extensive manhunts in Scottish criminal history. and was the first time that they had utilised methods that they had never used before. Now, police did say that the 18-month gap between the first and second murder is very unusual for a serial killer. So they even speculated that possibly the last two killings were by a copycat killer. And at the time, police did actually face a bit of backlash because they had jumped to conclusions by assuming that the killings were done by the same person but in my opinion I feel like that wasn't linked soon enough. Now in 2004 police did announce their intention to genetically test a number of men in hopes of identifying the perpetrator who was Bible John so with this they would request a blood sample from these concerned men and they were hoping to get a genetic match between their DNA and the semen sample. Now, they were able to get an 80% DNA match from one of the men who they conducted this genetic test on. So they figured that this man could be related to Bible John. With an 80% match, that means that he himself is not the suspect, but a possible relative very well could be. Now, the sole witness to ever have a conversation with Bible John and sit within Bible John's company, Jean, Helen's sister, she unfortunately died at the age of 74 in 2010. Now, the composite sketch that Jean had provided back in the day with the details that she was able to give still remains as the most likely to be Bible John. That's the one that's still used to try and identify him because the case does remain open till this day. I will also say as well, when Jean had heard the rumours that Peter Tobin could possibly have been Bible John, she shut this down and dismissed this immediately because being in his company, she knew for a fine fact that 
Peter Tobin was not Bible John. That's not who she spent that night with. So that is it for another True Crime and Makeup episode covering the unsolved case of Bible John. I am dying to know your thoughts, feelings, theories, opinions all down below in the comments. So please don't hold back. Let me know what you think. Have you seen any other theories online that you think are quite credible? Um, what do you think of my theory as well? I want to know what you think of that because I think it's quite good. I think it, it's possible. But I hope you found this case interesting. If you did, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Tell your friends and family to subscribe as well if you think true crime and makeup is something they would be interested in. Don't forget to leave your case suggestions down below in the comments or you can send them over to my email which will be up on the screen and down below in the description for you alongside my social media handle so my Instagram and TikTok if you want to give me a follow there but ultimately just make sure you're subscribed to my channel with the notification bell on so you don't miss when I upload which is two to three times per week. It's a good time. We have interesting cases. We cover them all. Unsolved, solved, serial killers, spree killers, cannibal families. We've got them all. But I really hope you enjoyed this case or at least found it interesting because enjoyed is always the wrong word. But until the next one, I shall see you later. Bye. <laughs>